Hello all my extremely attractive subscribers. Today I'm prepping some things to move to a new home yet again. This one should be the last move for us, I hope. But I'm using today's video to re-upload an old video that was demonetized by YouTube. That way these stories will not be forgotten, and these specific stories are a year and a half old. So many of you can enjoy them for the first time. These are five true scary stories from zoos. Who doesn't love cute animals? Remember to share your creepy experience with us at darkstories.org. Enjoy. I'll catch you guys tomorrow with a brand new video, I promise. Like this video and leave a comment below to let me know what sort of stories you want to hear next. Number one, Cayman Experience, submitted by Martina. For three years, I've worked at a reptile rescue zoo in Southwest Florida. We take in rescued reptiles as well as seized and repossessed animals by court order, and it's a family owned and run zoo. Instead of growing up with makeup and designer shoes, I played with geckos outdoors and wore boots. I've never really been a girly girl, if that makes sense. It's a life I love and wouldn't trade anything for. But one thing people always seem to forget, it's that animals can be very dangerous and unpredictable if not treated with proper respect. I learned the hard way six years ago when I was 17 years old. It wasn't the first time I'd shadowed my father on a rescue mission. I'd helped him get lizards and pythons from people's homes before. I'd even been bitten by a large monitor lizard just the year before, and that alone had earned me 20 stitches. But this was the biggest and by far the most dangerous creature we'd ever gone after before, a fully grown black caiman. It was easily 10 feet long and weighing in at over 200 pounds. He had been a rich man's pet, which he'd kept in a small pond on the large property. But when the caiman had eaten the neighbor's dog, the man was given a choice, have the state euthanize the animal, or we could rescue it. He chose us. This was a part of zoo work you don't really see often. Anyway, the pond was about 100 feet across, and the caiman had been basking along the shores of the pond, but for now it had decided to go back into the water. My dad thought we could catch him in a small dinghy the owner provided us using a usual crocodilian wrestling tool, which is a heavily reinforced lasso which we could close around the jaws of the beast. On all crocodilians, the muscles that open the animal's jaws are much weaker than those that close them. So if we could prevent it from biting and restrain the animal until it tired itself out, we could bind him peacefully for transportation. But this required the caiman getting close enough to the lasso, which was where I came in. Using a hunk of semi-frozen hamburger attached to a rope, I would lure the caiman so my dad, our head zoologist, would lasso the caiman. It sounded simple, but it's actually very, very dangerous. My dad paddled us out into the middle of the pond. The caiman was nowhere to be seen. It may have been at the bottom of the pond for all we knew. I threw the hunk of beef over the side and moved it through the water column, teasing it to create a scent trail. My dad was standing by the edge, scanning the water over his horn-rimmed glasses. I was painfully nervous. It was a big jump from carrying snakes and smaller lizards to something this big, and I wasn't sure if I was ready for it but the caiman didn't care about me being nervous. Within a few minutes, it came for the beef wholeheartedly, rising from the bottom and attacking it, massive trap-like jaws closing in on the bait. My father was quick and moved in with his lasso, but the old reptile seemed to see it coming. He kicked off, hitting the side of the boat with his tail. I was caught off balance already from the caiman swimming off and dragging the bait pole out of my hands, so the unthinkable happened. I fell overboard. The water of the pond was full of silt and was a murky black. My heart was thumping at a million miles an hour, and the shock of the cold darkness initially stopped me from moving, but I broke out of my trance quickly, 
I needed to get out of the water and away from the caiman right now. I surfaced, gasping for air as my dad yelled at me to get in the boat. He was furiously rowing the back of the boat up to me as I kicked for the lower rear entry of the dinghy. My dad seized my arm and began to pull me in when an indescribable crushing pain enveloped my left leg. I screamed, eyes wide in agony, as I realized another unthinkable thing had happened. The caiman had grabbed onto me. The world seemed to grow dim as I felt the creature go into its death roll, twisting flesh, tearing tendons, and straining the bones of my left leg. I heard, and rather felt, the sickening snap of my shin breaking. I dug my nails so deep into my dad's arm. The pain was white hot and boiling, and the world got louder. What with my screams, the boat engine, and my dad yelling at me to hold on, and the sound of my own bones coming unhinged with the beasts thrashing. I was blinded by my own tears and knew I was losing control fast and consciousness. The water around me turned red. The world was fading in and out and alternating between an eerily silent reddish brown underwater and a screaming terrifying surface reality. Dimly, I was aware of my dad hauling me with all of his might into the dinghy I finally felt the reassuring metal of the boat underneath me. The last thing I heard before passing out completely was the piercing bang of my dad's nine millimeter. I woke up in the hospital two weeks later. I had been in a coma for several days after surgery, and even more painfully, I learned the doctors had been forced to amputate the lower half of my leg as the caiman had managed to almost completely sever it before my dad ended its life. I'd lost a pint and a half of blood, and I was permanently, mentally, and physically scarred by this horrible experience. My dad and I both knew how close I'd come to passing away that day. I now have a prosthetic lower leg, and I'm still able to work at our zoo, but I don't do rescues for the zoo anymore. My father also no longer uses bait to catch crocodilians, opting for more patient tactics. I still love my work, and working with these magnificent animals was a big part of my recovery. Just remember to respect nature, take good care of your pets, and remember that sometimes exotic animals should never be pets in the first place. Number two the creepiest zoo experience ever, submitted by the best freaking ghost. It happened two years ago. I come from a small town in Virginia, so my family and I decided that we would take a small road trip to Northern Virginia. On our way to our hotel in Harrisonburg, we saw a zoo nearby. I had never been to a zoo before, so I begged my mom to take me the next day. She agreed. The day after that, I woke up and my family drove me to the zoo. They dropped me off and they decided to go to the classic car museum. I was 13 at the time, so they trusted me. I bought my ticket and entered the zoo. It was fairly empty at the time due to it being very early in the morning. I looked around at a few animal enclosures, feeling eyes following me the entire time. I turned around at one point, and standing right behind me was an old man with a dirty beard and yellow teeth. Do you need some help, child? He said. I jumped back and ran off in the other direction toward the elephant enclosure. I thought I was safe, but I was wrong. I walked around the giraffes and the elephants for a while before heading over to a birdcage that people were able to walk into. As I opened the door, I stepped into the room to my left and sanitized my hands so that I could get inside, as per the rules. I was about to actually enter the enclosure and go inside when I felt a hand on my shoulder. It was the same guy from before with the yellow teeth. I tried to run out the door, but he grabbed me by my shoulders and pushed me into one of the wooden walls behind me. I could instantly smell his breath. It was horrible, and I was scared out of my mind. Why are you running, he asked. 
I struggled in his grasp, but he wouldn't let me go. I kicked and kicked, but he was still in my face. He then tried to put his lips on me, and I kneed him in the stomach. I was finally able to get away from him, and I ran for the door. I ran down past the llama cages and ducked behind them. I saw the man run past the cage. I then made a break for the entrance where I got my ticket earlier. I stayed outside of the zoo for the remainder of the time until my parents picked me up. I didn't tell them what had happened right away. But as we drove away, I saw the man standing in the parking lot with a yellow-toothed grin on his face. I should have told someone right away, and if I ever wanted to be cautious again, maybe going when other people were around was a better idea. Number three. It warned us, submitted by CG. There are a few important things you need to know before I get to the meat of this experience. I, along with a small group of friends, like to call ourselves urban explorers. We watch the YouTube videos where the totally not faked creepy stuff happens in abandoned malls and whatnot, and decided it could be fun to do it ourselves. We had already went into a school and two abandoned restaurants before, and we had now decided we wanted to hit up the zoo. It was an hour and a half away from where we lived. However, all three of the locations we had been to before had been in broad daylight. The last one being a restaurant where some random redneck took it upon himself to yell at us for trespassing when he saw us from the main road. Since we didn't want to deal with any more vigilante justice, we were feeling a bit braver so we decided to explore the zoo at night. I'm not going to expose the name of the zoo because I don't want to expose myself or allow any more people to get the bad idea that we had. It's just not worth it. All you need to know is that it's an abandoned place in North America. There were three of us going since one of our friends didn't feel comfortable going at night. He was the smart one. For obvious reasons, I'm not giving names so we can call my friends that were there, Bob and Jack. Between us, we each had two flashlights just in case we needed a backup, a few power bars, various snacks, and a bunch of water bottles. I even brought a survival knife, more for comfort than anything else. We piled ourselves and our supplies into my Jeep, then went on our way. It took us two hours to get to the abandoned zoo, since Bob decided he absolutely needed to stop at Zaxby's. He's obsessed with his axe sauce, and I can't blame him, though. Anyway, back to the subject. By the time we got there, it was already dark outside, and we had no idea where anything is in the place, since none of us had ever been here before. There was a steel gate blocking off the drive to get in, but as I had a lifted Jeep, we had no problem just driving around it. The parking lot was where we started getting bad vibes. We came across another makeshift fence, but it was made completely out of light posts and other random zoo exhibit type signs. And there was a stop sign sticking ominously out of the middle. We couldn't drive around this one because there was a drainage ditch on either side of the barrier, and I wasn't about to flip my Jeep trying to get through it so we had to walk it from there. We get across the parking lot to the admission area. All the kiosks were destroyed, and the leftover debris looked like it was arranged to pose yet another obstacle for us. Since on the other side of the rubble, there were 12-foot fences with posts that ended in sharp, pointy curves, and this wreckage was dangerous. We were operating purely by moonlight and flashlight, and there were nails and splinters all over. This had quickly become our most dangerous exploration by the time we finally crossed the former ticket booths. When we finally got in, Jack jumped. He said he had seen some eyes, like an animal's, so we all froze. But we didn't hear anything. Just a coon or possum or something, we thought, as we continued on. We soon confirmed our suspicions that the signs and light posts used to make the fence in front of the parking lot were taken from inside the zoo, as there were holes in the ground everywhere with wires sticking out, as well as sheared metal where signs had apparently been ripped off of cages. It appeared this was done in a hurry, since the removal sites looked violent. 
Other than that so far, it was really boring. Just cages of varying size and a reptile house that had the only door in blocked with a wrecked golf cart. That was pretty weird, I guess. Soon though, we came upon a fence that said personnel only and the gate was deadbolted shut. Fortunately, or unfortunately, I guess, the deadbolt was so rusted out that we could break it without much protest. There was a steel sheet metal building that we had to go around, but on the other side is where we found it. On the far side of the building, we found what I can only assume were unmarked animal graves, around 50 of them, and they immediately freaked us out. I'm not usually freaked out by cemeteries, but the vibes of this place made it hard to breathe. Jack whispered some profanities under his breath, and Bob stood silently. I said that we need to leave now, that this place just wasn't right, and they didn't argue at all. We power walked out of the newly broken gate and made our way to the ticket booth area as fast as we could walk. We should have been running. When we were about 75 yards from the gate, I began to hear what sounded like a horse galloping on dirt, and we all turned around. This is where it gets bizarre, unbelievable, and absolutely terrifying. It was a freaking silverback gorilla stampeding towards us. We all froze. It was going twice as fast as we could possibly run. I was in front, so it got to my friends first, never breaking its stride as it went right through us. There was no wind, not even the slightest push as it went through us, but it left me feeling colder than I ever remembered being in my entire life. I turned around fast to see where it had gone, and to my surprise, it was standing right behind me, staring into my eyes as I turned. It was pale, its eyes were bloodshot, and even though my flashlight was illuminating it, it seemed to glow. I reached for my knife, but I soon realized I had left it in the Jeep. Deep down, I knew it wouldn't have done me any good. The gorilla then started to beat on the ground hard and then on its chest, followed by a scream. And then and there right in front of us, it just faded away from existence like nothing had ever been there. We stood there in silence. After a few seconds of being paralyzed to our spots, I spun around to see both of my friends still staring at where the ape had come from. They were too scared to turn and see the gorilla like I had, and I didn't blame them. I did, however, yell, run, without hesitation. As if they had been waiting for someone to say those very words, we all turned and ran away. We were to the ticket booths in under a minute, and sprinted over the wreckage without any regard for safety at this point. Bob's pant leg ended up getting caught on a nail and ripped out a sizable chunk of his fabric. I wasn't as lucky though. A large splinter of wood about six inches long pierced the side of my tennis shoe and embedded half of its length into my foot. I was in pretty good shape at the time and with the amount of adrenaline in my system, it didn't slow me down much. We hit the parking lot at full tilt, and we were quickly through the drainage ditch and past the creepy sign fence. We practically flung the doors open and dove into the Jeep. As I turned the key in the ignition, starting the vehicle, I turned on my light pods and light bar that I installed on the Jeep to get as much visibility of my surroundings as possible, and I wished I hadn't. The Jeep was at an angle that the LEDs were shining light off to the right of the makeshift fence. This meant we could see past the parking lot and through the 12-foot fence that surrounded the zoo itself. And on the other side of the fence were eyes, at least a 100 reflecting eyes. I heard Jack behind me excel a, oh God. He was cut off from saying anything else when we lurched forward as I put the pedal to the metal in reverse. I popped one of the curbs, then quickly did a semi-donut in the grassy dirt that was on the side of the road. The second I hit asphalt again, we were gone, going 70 in what was a 35 mile per hour zone. 
In around 50 minutes, as opposed to the hour and a half drive it should have taken, we were back in town. I was in a lot of pain at this point, so we had to stop at the emergency room to get my foot cleaned up. My shoe was ruined with a hole in the side and covered in dry blood. My foot could also be described in the exact same way. The nurses and doctor cleaned up my foot, bandaging it up and saying the usual, just stay off it for a while. I was really lucky that the shard of wood hadn't severed any muscle or tendon though, and I'm thankful for that. As we were leaving, one of the nurses asked how I'd done that to my foot, and I dryly responded with, I was running from a phantom gorilla. She let out a confused and nervous giggle as I walked out of the automatic doors without any emotion whatsoever. Me and Jack were roommates, so when we got back to our apartment at two in the morning, which is where Bob had left his car, we just let Bob stay the rest of the night with us. We still explore occasionally, but never at night, and never anywhere that is not within running distance of civilization. Nothing this intense has ever happened to us again, and I'm very glad. To any other explorers out there, if you haven't already figured it out, be careful, because you may find whatever it is that you're looking for, and much, much more. Number four, The Meerkat Man, submitted by Fiona. I was seven years old, and we were at the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle, Washington. My family and I were at the meerkat exhibit. This exhibit had a jungle gym cave type thing next to the indoor exhibit. This cave play space imitates a meerkat's burrow. There are several child-shaped holes weaving through it. All the holes and tunnels lead to a two foot tall cavern in the middle. Near the cavern was an exit an adult could fit through. My mother and father at the time were in the exhibit, while I was outside climbing around the play place. There was an older kid playing nearby, so they figured I would be fine. I was going to climb through a hole in the top. I poked my head in when I saw a man. He reminded me a lot of my friend Tyler's dad, which of course it wasn't him. The stranger lay there motionless with tangled hair, a crop top, and bell-bottom jeans. He was sitting in the fetal position and not looking at me. I remember liking the funny giraffe print on his bell-bottoms, but then I smelled the cave. It smelled of urine and rot, but at the age of seven, I didn't care much and just wanted to keep playing. I flopped onto the man and scrambled into another tunnel as he was in the way. I was crawling and the floor was wet and sticky. I emerged as the tunnels were only like three feet long, but at that age, the place seemed bigger than it was. Only like five kids squished together could fit in it. As you were guessing, I realized soon that someone had peed in the play place. It was all over my clothes and I was basically soaked in someone else's fluids. I was a germaphobe as a kid, so I went inside and made my mom take me to wash my hands. I never saw that man again, but basically a passed out hippie or homeless man crawled into the kid's meerkat play space, passed out and peed everywhere, and I had basically got soaked in it. This is a memory I really don't like thinking about. And number five, I was a night guard at a zoo, submitted by Libelous. I used to work as a night guard at a zoo in Oklahoma. Used to. Nowadays, I work from home reselling imports. It's great to work for yourself, but basically anything is better than staying at that dang zoo. This particular zoo was a small one, and my responsibilities were pretty light. When I was looking to work there and had gotten hired on at last, I remember being overjoyed as if I had won the lottery. A night job working alone without a boss in a tiny zoo, I was going to be the captain of the gravy train. It wasn't until one night in particular that I no longer wanted to work this job. 
I can barely explain my experience, as it was so crazy, but I'll try my best. It was a Tuesday night. Business days were painfully slow for the day crew, which made my job even easier. The owner liked me to pick up any litter I stumbled upon, so the only annoying part of my job was picking up the trash the janitor may have missed, but as it had been so slow, the place was clean. About three hours into my shift though, the electricity suddenly shut off. All at once, the security camera monitors, lights, everything had gone out. Luckily, we had a backup generator, which kept the locks on all the enclosures secured, so animals escaping weren't a problem. Then again, the generator did not back up any of the lights here, so I was in pitch black darkness. Cursing under my breath, I decided to get up and get out under the full moon. I couldn't see two inches in front of my face, after all, in the security building, so it was pointless to stay in there. It was better to patrol than to sit in the intrepid darkness, I thought. After walking around the outer perimeter, checking the fence and making sure no one was trying to trespass, I took some free time I had to go check out the lions. The lions had always been my favorite. They were big, quiet, yet ferocious-looking creatures. I often came to their enclosure on my shifts, just to watch them for a few minutes. At night, they usually slept, but sometimes you could catch them awake, acting like giant house cats. When I came within about 20 yards of the enclosure, I stopped, petrified and bewildered. I wasn't alone in the zoo, and I didn't mean the zoo animals. There was something leaning on the enclosure fence, a fence which was around 20 feet tall. The scary part was the thing was nearly as tall as that fence, it was thick and reminded me more of a pot-bellied, middle-aged man from its silhouette. It was too dark, though, for me to make out many details, and I was far too terrified to walk any closer. It seemed to just be staring down at the lions, who were sleeping soundly. Even still, from the distance, I could hear the bellowing, slow breathing of the creature. In and out, each inhale or exhale lasted about 12 seconds. This thing was taking in a heck of a lot of air. I stayed there for a straight hour, and the thing stayed there the entire time. At the end of the hour, it slowly lifted itself up from the cage, turned around, and literally stepped over the outer perimeter, leaving the zoo entirely. I ran back to the security room and checked the cameras. Sadly, we didn't have enough cameras to cover much of the zoo, and that included the lion enclosure. That didn't stop me from scanning through all of them, though. Once the power came back on, which wasn't too long after that experience, yet I didn't catch sight of the giant creature. Even though the cameras continued to function after the lights went off, it was the monitors I had to wait for. For the remainder of the dark night, I stayed in the security room, too scared to leave, brainstorming not about what the thing I saw could be, but what it could come back and do at any moment. By the time the morning crew arrived, I had shocked and scared myself so bad, I quit and didn't go back. Believe me, don't believe me, I don't care. I'm sharing my experience, and I know what I saw. I know my brain and body reacted with complete and utter terror. I haven't been back to a zoo in decades. I mean, I love to go see animals, but I don't love the smell. I'm sure they don't love my smell. A big dose of my Old Spice probably drives those gorillas crazy. But to those who do love going often, don't let this stop you. Just watch out for those crazy people with bolt cutters who are ready to release the lions at any moment. I bet those big cats are ready to feast. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And don't forget to send me your creepy stories from concerts at darknessprevails.org submit. As per usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about five horrifying hiking encounters. Spooky Fish says, I got a pet lizard today. 
You lucky son of a fish. I'm happy for you. I've been thinking about getting a chameleon myself. Those things are weird. Arabella Patterson says, now I'm not leaving my house. Oh, don't you worry. My next video will be five true I'm not leaving my house scary stories. Jinj71 says, hey darkness, how's it hanging? Short and shriveled, my friend, short and shriveled. Austin McKenna says, unfortunately I love hiking, so yeah, now I know death is almost a guarantee. Hey, in this day and age of political correctness, death is the easy way out, and often the sexiest. And Karma NN says, hikers are very tasty. I've tried to get my wife to lick off my sweat after a good run, but I can't blame her for saying no. Thank you so much for sticking around and listening to my video. I appreciate you stopping by. I hope you got a few scares. Here are the credits for my patrons who continue to support my channel. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy.